Hey, welcome back to the channel. Uh, today, we're going to talk about the uh, Ruger M77 bolt action rifle. We have a representative example here of a very early gun, uh, the Tang safety gun. And this is uh, a, certainly a first year gun. It's probably a first couple of months gun. Three digit serial number, serial numbers under 400. So very early representative example of this rifle. So let's look at where it came from. Uh, in 1964, Winchester uh, famously or infamously, however you want to, to look at that, redesigned their Model 70 bolt action rifle and changed a lot of things, changed the way the action worked, they changed to stamp parts on the inside. They did quite a bit of stuff that uh, really angered a lot of people uh, in response to Remington's introduction of the Model 700. Uh, and the reason for all this, including the Savage 110, which was coming about at the same time as well, is they were trying to get manufacturing costs under control to where they could turn out a good rifle for less retail money. So Remington kind of led their way. We've talked about it in the Remington 700 video. Please take a look at that one if you get the opportunity. And uh, Winchester followed suit. Well, Bill Ruger noticed all of this and really wanted to get into the bolt action rifle market. He already had semi-automatic rifles with a model 44 carbine uh, called the Deerstalker at that time. The Ruger 1022 was out there. He had his 22 pistols. He had uh, some single action uh, revolvers out there, but he wanted a bolt, and, and the number one Ruger was coming about two in the early 60s, a single shot. So he wanted a bolt action gun. So. He hired a designer by the name of James Sullivan. And James Sullivan had been working uh, with Armalite and most notably working with Eugene Stoner on the development of the AR-15 platform, M16 platform, that type of stuff. And he came over to Ruger and one of his first tasks was to produce and design a bolt action rifle with one important caveat. And this was a, a, a Bill Ruger thing. It was, it's been a Bill Ruger thing forever and ever, and that was the use of investment casting in the production of the parts. And, and that was uh, a big deal. The gun had to uh, use investment castings, and that was going to be Bill Ruger's way of getting around the manufacturer cost. It's much less expensive to produce parts using that casting process at the time than the forgings that the other manufacturer were using. The castings or less, uh, less machine time for the finished product, less waste on the finished product. And uh, Ruger believed that it was going to be absolutely uh, as strong as any other forged product that was coming out. It turns out he was right. We'll talk about that in just a minute. But uh, So Sullivan got to work designing the gun. Now Ruger was, Bill Ruger, was a, a huge fan of the 98 Mauser and, and there are design, uh, design features here of the Ruger 77 that mimic that of the 98 Mauser, but but not quite. And there's still a lot of people. There are still a lot of people that think, for example, that this early this early Ruger, uh, the Tang safety Rugers, the ones with the Tang safety here pre 1991 guns, they see this long extractor down the bolt like a Mauser gun, and they believe that it's a controlled round action where the the cartridge case is completely controlled by the bolt during the feeding process. It's not the case. This is a push feed action similar to the post 6494, uh, post 64 Winchester 70 and the Remington 700. So if we pull the bolt, just like you would pull the bolt on a 98 Mauser, we look and see that there's no cutout here. There, there's no where for the rim to feed up. So uh, the cartridge pops over this extractor once it is fully chambered and we have a plunger Remington 700 style ejector in the bolt. So this is a push feed action, not a control round feed action. And it was that way until 1991. Uh, in 1991, the entire gun was redesigned into the Ruger 77 Mark II. We get to a, an actual control round feed action with some other changes. But let's, let's take a look at this earlier gun, at some of the good stuff and some of the bad stuff. So we had the, uh, we had the investment casting of the parts and that was that was a huge deal and and throughout the 70s uh it was kind of like the colt pepsi wars if you will if you remember uh, if you go back long enough like i do remember all the advertising wars between colt and pepsi it was the same thing between ruger and the other manufacturers casting versus forging 
And uh, the one that sticks in my mind involved the Ruger GP100 revolver. Uh, they would come out and say this is stronger than the Smith L-frame, which it debuted in, in the 80s. And Smith & Wesson, I, I, can, I can see the ad in my head vividly to this day, had an advertisement showing a, a steak, beef steak on a plate with a GP100 barrel sticking out one side and the GP100 grip frame sticking out the bottom of the meat. And the, the ad was, you know, having thickness sometimes is great for steak, but not on your gun, you know. So it, it, was, a, it was a whole big thing. It was kind of amusing at the time. But time has uh, really shown, especially on the single action revolvers that Ruger made, that the, the casting was every bit as strong as any, any of the forge frame and forge part guns that are out there now. And interestingly enough, these companies that were really bashing Ruger, if you will, for the use of cast parts, now routinely use metal injection molded parts in their firearms. So it's kind of a full circle deal and they're not talking about casting anymore. But uh, Ruger and also Ruger has had uh, Pine Tree Casting has been their company since 1963. And they're, they're providing OEM cast parts for many, many other manufacturers in the firearms industry and in many, many other industries. Uh, around the world so uh, I think that's pretty much a dead issue uh, but even still to this day we run into both consumers and even gunsmiths that either don't want to work on the Ruger or they don't want to, to shoot the Ruger or they don't want to have anything to do with the Ruger because of some misconception about the cast parts and I think that really should be put to bed. Anyway back, back to the rifle so uh, the rifle is uh, a Mauser pattern gun, like we said, except it is a, a push feed action uh, from 1968 when it was introduced until 1991 when the Mark II uh, modifications were introduced. So we do have the opposing locking lugs 90 degrees. We have the long extractor. Now note on this early gun, this is called a flat bolt gun because we don't have a big round bolt knob on the end. It's, it's kind of flat down through here. So uh, it's called a flat knob. And on, like all these uh, original Ruger 77s, we have the two position tang safety here. And this does lock the bolt when the, uh, when the bolt is closed. Putting it on safe locks the bolt, locks the action. So you have to take the gun off safety. Now, uh, the trigger, the original trigger on these 77s were adjustable. There's three screws in the trigger. One is way to pull, then you have sear engagement, then you have over travel. Uh, and it's adjustable to a point. It'll go down to a little under three pounds and then you can continue to back out the spring on, on the trigger pull and it won't do anything because the spring has expanded as far as it's going to get in its housing. So it becomes a point of replacing a spring or changing a trigger. Uh, changing the triggers on these guns oftentimes requires fitting, uh, especially on the, on the Mark IIs that have the, the uh, three position safety on the bolt. So, uh, it may be uh, maybe something you don't want to try to do yourself. Maybe you know, if you're somewhat handy with tools and understand the gun a little bit, it, it's certainly within uh, a DIYer's ability to do it. But if not, a, certainly a good gunsmith can do it for you, no problem. But these guns were designed to have reasonable trigger pulls and reasonable accuracy. And that brings me to another point about these early 77s. Up until uh, the uh, Ruger Mark II, Ruger didn't make their own barrels. Uh, the barrels were contracted out. And they had good days and they had bad days. You had good guns and you had not so good guns. Um, some of them will shoot really, really well, then some of them don't shoot all that well. But let's put that in perspective. Uh, at the time, what was considered good accuracy on a production deer rifle, if you will, was about a minute and a half. If you were shooting one and a half inches at 100 yards, people really call that good for the most part. And it's certainly not today. The expectation today is that an out-of-the-box rifle, it doesn't matter if it's a budget gun or if it's an expensive gun or whatever gun it is, uh, people expect that to shoot a minute of angle or less. And it's just not the case on these rifles. Can they be made to shoot? Well, yeah, uh, probably uh, with a trigger and with bedding and if you've got a good barrel. so. Uh, and the bedding part brings us to uh, another issue or per perceived issue with this gun, and that's how the gun's uh, action is screwed, or the action screws are, are uh, configured. So these two are traditional, the rear, these two screws are traditional vertical screws. 
this screw here is angled this way and actually screws into a relatively small recoil lug on the bottom of the flat action. And I'm not going to take it out of the stock because of some torque values on these screws, and we'll talk about that here in a second. But the, the recoil lug that's part of the uh, flat bottom receiver is relatively short, relatively small compared to the uh, detached recoil lug of a Remington 700, say, for example. And this Ford screw screws into that. So uh, from the factory, this, uh, this front angled screw is up there in the neighborhood of 90 inch pounds of torque, which is uh, more than a typical uh, like Wheeler torque wrench will, will get you. So uh, it's a ton. Now, th does that mean it has to be that high? No, there, if you talk to people and, and read all the internet uh, forums and all that, you'll see that some people are, are getting good results at 35 foot pounds, some people need 50, uh, but this is, or inch pounds, this is one of those areas where you have to kind of mate it to your rifle. And, and whether you have the, the wood stock or the composite stock, that all seems to make a difference. If you start messing with these torque values, you have to make sure that all of these uh, screws are balanced. If one's over torqued more than another, this won't work correctly. The magazine box won't be correctly seated. And the floor plate won't act like it's supposed to. So uh, all that it sounds complicated. It's, it's really not. Uh, but it is something that, that has to be looked at and has to be paid attention to if you want to make these guns shoot. If you're okay with minute of deer, or, you know, an inch and a half at 100 yards, which is at least here in Southeast Texas, that's pretty typical. Uh, shot on whitetail, Ruger 77 will do it all day long. Now the the later guns, the uh, 77 Mark II that came out in 1991 had a non-adjustable trigger. So, uh, and uh, it had a true control round feed bolt, fixed blade ejector, ejector wasn't a plunger in the bolt, it was more like the traditional Mauser 98. So uh, still had investment uh, cast parts, that, that hadn't changed. But Ruger started doing cold hammer forged barrels at that point. So we had a little bit more consistency in their barrel production, a little bit more consistency in their action uh, on the, from 1991 forward on the Mark IIs. And in 2007, Ruger introduced the Ruger Hawkeye, which is the current version of the Model 77 action. One piece stainless steel bolt on the Hawkeye and has Ruger's LC6 trigger, which is a user adjustable trigger, but only for uh, way to pull. It, it's still a, a good trigger, not nearly as good as a Timney, uh, but still a, a decent hunting trigger. So the trigger on the 77 is one of those areas where it's good, uh, but not great. I mean, some work has to be done to make it into a great trigger, but it can get there. Uh, it may be outside of the realm of the typical home tinkerer, but it, it can certainly be done. So back to this early rifle. And for anyone that has a Ruger Tang safety rifle, guns made before 1991, there was a safety bulletin put out. I don't know that it quite rises to the level of a recall, but there's a safety bulletin put out about the over-travel screw on this trigger. So if we were to pull it out of the stock, there'd be three screws, and one in the top of the trigger, in the, in the forward portion of the trigger box, is the screw that uh, controls the over-travel on this trigger. And what Ruger found out is that Sometimes they weren't secured properly when they were adjusted at the factory and it could back out or move in and either cause the gun to unintentionally fire when the bolt closed or not fire at all, depending on how that screw had situated itself. And the fix was uh, to call Ruger, get a hold of Ruger, and they would send a new uh, hex lockable over travel screw and even the free Allen wrench to put it in. Uh, with detailed instructions on how to do it. You didn't have to take it to anybody. You didn't have to send it back to Ruger to make that happen. Either you could do it or your gunsmith could do it. It's, it's not a big deal. But uh, if it was done at the factory, it would have a letter T inscribed, uh, engraved here on the underside of the bolt handle. Now you notice this one does not. So when we pop this gun out of the stock, when we get it back in the shop, pop this gun out of the stock, we're going to look and see if that screw's in there. And if not, we're going to uh, get a hold of Ruger and get that screw in here and put that in. The reason we have this rifle, and it's very unfortunate, is that right about in here, this barrel uh, in the bore is heavily pitted. Uh, it was just, uh, I'm not sure what happened to it. Uh, the story that I got is uh, insects or wasps or something that built a nest. I don't know what it is, but uh, the end result is after we cleaned all that out, this bore from here to here is pretty heavily pitted. Uh, 
short enough that we can't shorten and crown the barrel to make it legal. So we're going to rebarrel this unit uh, and the customer wants to go from 243, which is the current caliber, uh, to 7mm 08, which is just a simple matter of rebarreling. But uh, and that brings me to another point on these Rugers. We still run into gunsmiths that won't work on them because they're investment cast and, and really not a reason for that at all. There's no big trick to rebarreling these. Uh, a Mauser 98 action wrench will work. Uh, any of the flat bottom action wrenches will work uh, to pull the action off of this barrel. It's the same barrel threads, uh, one inch by 16 turns per inch uh, on the barrel threads that Ruger's always used on the 77 rifles. So uh, there's no difficulty associated with it being a cast receiver. And what we've heard is that, oh, if you over tighten it, you could cause problems with the cast receiver. Well, you know, newsflash, if you over tighten it, you can cause problems with the forged receiver too. So uh, the trick is don't over tighten it, right? Do it right the first time. But, uh, you don't even have to cut a broaching cut in the barrel face like you would with a 98 Mauser or a Model 70. So it's a, a relatively straightforward gun to rebarrel. So one other thing I want to bring up about these guns, and Ruger guns in general, with the casting, and this it hasn't happened to this gun, is sometimes you will see receivers on Ruger 77s or frames on Blackhawks, Super Blackhawks, uh, slides on the Ruger P-Series semi-auto pistols that will initially have been blued like this gun here, but they've turned into a darkish purple color, and collectors call those plums, P-L-U-M, plum colored guns, and it does kind of look plum colored, I guess. Um, I'm a guy, so I see purple, and I, you know, I've been told there are like 11,000 shades of purple by various females in my life, but uh, to me it's purple. But in any event, the reason for that is because of the metals that were used in the casting process. Now, uh, forgings start as casting, if you think about it, because of those, there's no, if you look on the periodic chart, there's no element of steel. They're, they're all alloys, they're all melted together into ingots and they're forged and machined, or in this case, they're poured into molds cast and machined. So they all start from the same place. So it depends on which alloys and in what uh, percentages they're put together and melted to form the 4140 alloy steel that's used in this casting. So uh, during the bluing process, this is heated in a, uh, the steel is heated in an alkali solution up to about 295 degrees and it, it turns this oxide or it oxidizes to this blue black color. Now, depending on the actual chemical makeup of the steel, the type of alloy, the type of, of metals that are in there, Sometimes they have to heat that up to 302, 304, 305 to make it actually turn blue to get out of that purple color. Or there are some additives that are put into the bluing salts to make it take this color. It's the same problem that you have with post-64 Winchester 94s uh, and things of that that are, that are a different steel makeup, if you will. So um, in almost any other manufacturer, if you see uh, that plum color, you immediately have to think about, oh, has this gun been reblued, or has, have, what has gone on with this gun to make it this color? But it can be a natural process or a natural process in aging. You know, as these guns get 10, 15, 20 years old, you see them start turning that plum color. Uh, and it can be a natural thing, it can be a normal thing. And there's actually actually some Ruger collectors that recognize that as, uh, I don't know if it's, doesn't necessarily add value to the gun. I, I don't know that it detracts from the value of the gun for that matter, but they recognize it as a variation, if you will, and, and some people actually seek those plum-colored guns out. So I've seen it in uh, 77s, uh, the single-action revolver frames, old model Blackhawks, old model, old model Super Blackhawks especially. And I, I don't know that I've seen it in 44 Magnum carbines. I, I probably have, but uh, it's not unusual. It, it shouldn't be anything that you're scared about. It doesn't mean the receiver's bad. It just means that uh, over time, the uh, the bluing has turned into that plum color. So it, it's really nothing to get all uh, upset about and run run away from. The uh, the floor plate. These are these are cast out of an aluminum alloy. Uh, that's another cost saving thing that Ruger did to make the gun uh, a reasonable cost. The stocks are typically, and, and I've 
said this for years that you know it looked like Ruger took two by fours from 84 lumber and made stocks out of them because uh, you don't normally get a whole lot of figure in a Ruger stock and again it, they were trying to keep up with the Joneses or the or the idea was to have a uh, reasonably priced everyman rifle that could do uh, that could do the job well and, and they did that successfully now that said there have been many, many Ruger variants, uh, Ruger 77 variants introduced over the years of production. And some of them have really nice uh, Turkish walnut or Circassian walnut stocks in them. Uh, and then there's been the whole run of the, the infamous bolt paddle stocks, the, uh, the synthetic stocks with the cutouts here, uh, that are actually bringing big money on the collector market today. They had, uh, this is a Ruger 77R with the Ruger, and this was new when this gun was introduced as well. The top of the receiver is milled to accommodate the Ruger rings. The Ruger rings came with the rifle. So it's the 77R. If this gun also had iron sights, it'd be the 77RS. They had the 77 African with sights and the bigger caliber. There's a whole bunch of them. Uh, the 77RSI, another very collectible gun, was a full length stock on a shorter barrel. And uh, those are bringing, or they can bring $1,000 or more on the collector market pretty easily. Uh, one of my favorite variants uh, came out in the early 80s, I think it was 83-ish. Uh, it was still a tank safety gun, but it was a Ruger 77 UL, which was the ultralight guns, uh, 18 or 20 inch barrel. I think it was a 20 inch barrel, very light profile barrel. And the stock was very hollowed out in there. And, and we had a uh, shop I had at the time had a contract with uh, a distributor in Houston and we took a bunch of those rifles and we put them into hand bedded uh, composite stocks. At that time, Kevlar was just starting to be a thing, so we bedded them into those composite stocks and did a black parkerized finish on the barrel to make it look like it, or on that metal to make it look like it was rust blued. And we came out with really decent rifles and really cool calibers like 7x57 and uh, obviously the 243 and things like that. Uh, and they tipped the scale at about five pounds. 12 ounces, I think, or five pounds, 14. So they were very, very light, and they were just cool little guns. But unfortunately, that distributor didn't last very long, so that, that rifle didn't go uh, go very far, unfortunately. I think we did like 60 of them. But uh, cool guns, Ruger 77s. There's still a lot of, of bashing on this gun because of the investment casting, and there was a lot of bashing on Ruger, uh, especially in the 90s, because Unfortunately, Bill, Bill Ruger was the kind of guy who had his opinion, and by God, that was his opinion, and that's the way it was gonna be. And sometimes he didn't read the room very well. Uh, when the Clinton crime ban, or the Biden crime ban came about, according to Biden, uh, Bill Ruger was a proponent of it. He uh, came out in support of 10 round uh, maximum capacity magazines, things like that. And then people really uh, turned off on Ruger quite a bit. And it wasn't until some years later, after uh, Bill Ruger himself was gone, and the board of directors said, okay, let's reset all this, and, and there we go. But if you think about it, at the time, Bill Ruger didn't have an AR platform rifle out there. He had the Mini-14, and the Mini-14 was not an assault rifle, according to the assault weapons bill. So anyway, I mean, we can get, I, I don't want to get into the politics of it, but it's just an interesting little side thing on on the man himself, Ruger and his guns. Great. Uh, Obviously, he had a, a great company and still one of the stronger companies today. And this Ruger 77 is part of that. Um, it came out in 1964, uh, and it's still in production today as a Hawkeye variant. I don't know how many uh, have been produced. It's in the millions, I'm sure. But uh, they've been produced in everything from the Rimfire version in 17 HMR all the way up through 458 lot, 416 Rigby, uh, in various and, and just countless different variations. So. Don't be afraid of these older guns. The Tang safety guns have their own little quirks as far as being able to bet them, doing things with the trigger, um, and then the weird color variation, and the barrel. So if you, if you get one that shoots well, uh, take care of it. And uh, if you get one that only shoots an inch and a half, understand that that's kind of what the design was to begin with. And it, they're great rifles. Don't shy away from it at all. Hey, thanks for uh, watching the video. Uh, please like, please subscribe to the video comment let us know uh, if there's something that you want us to take a look at or something that you want us to talk about we'll do our, our best opportunity to find that for you and, and pay attention to the other stuff on the channel 
and we will see you uh, next time around. Thanks a bunch.